Afghanistan's President Ashraf Ghani is set to put forward a three-phase peace roadmap for Afghanistan. The roadmap will be tabled during a proposed meeting in Turkey in the coming weeks. The meeting is aimed at uh, seeking an agreement with the Taliban and ceasefire before elections. To get a better sense of what to expect from the much-talked-about peace roadmap, we're now joined via Zoom from London by the founder and editor-in-chief of the Afghan Eye, Ahmed Walid Kaka. He's in London in the UK. Thanks very much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome to the programme. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. So the Afghan story is, is a long one and it's uh, just been struggle after struggle, violence. And do you think that we're starting to get to a point where there is some hope and some light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, well, I think we can split the general perspective into two parts. First of all, I think there is a realization uh, on all sides, at least we can hope that there is, that conflict isn't really working and that there is no military solution to the conflict. The United States has realized that, the Taliban have realized that, and judging by Ashraf Ghani's uh, recent uh, peace plan that he's proposed, he's realized that as well. The problem, however, is that the roadmap as to how to get to peace uh, is something that's very much differed upon. So Ashraf Ghani's peace plan is uh, markedly different from that which was pro uh, proposed by the U.S. Secretary of State uh, Blinken in a letter to Ashraf Ghani. And it's also very different to the uh, peace agreement the Taliban signed with the U.S. Uh, or rather with the Trump administration last year in February. All right, let's talk about uh, his peace plan and how different it is. Uh, so what happened was that the uh, initial Doha deal that was signed between the Taliban and the Trump uh, administration uh, is, was delayed by about six months because Ashraf Ghani's government was not party to those negotiations which stipulated a prisoner exchange between the Afghan government and the Taliban. And now, whilst the, you, Ashraf Ghani has been very vocal as well uh, about uh, being opposed to the formation of an interim government, uh, in this peace plan he is uh, advocating the formation of an uh, interim government. However, there's a problem in that he's also advocating for elections. Uh, the last election that was held in Afghanistan was held last year. There was about a standoff that lasted months and that resulted in two presidents being inaugurated side by side. That was only resolved uh, with US mediation. And so with the history of fraud and voter, uh, voting irregularities in Afghanistan, the concept of uh, another election that would take months more uh, to finalize the results of is one that's unpalatable mm. uh, to the Taliban who've rejected the peace plan and one that would be unpalatable to the US which wants to move the peace process forward as soon as possible. What have the Taliban been fighting for? What is a non-negotiable for them? Uh, a non-negotiable for the Taliban is the fact they're fighting what they see as a foreign occupation of their country and for the establishment of what they see as an Islamic government. And uh, what foreign the, the, they managed to achieve the former, at least in theory, with the signing of the agreement with the Trump administration, which stipulated that all U.S. forces would leave by May the 1st. Uh, but now that too is in doubt with Biden, with President Biden and other U.S. officials casting doubt upon that and, you know, indicating reluctance. And their stated goal of establishing an Islamic government is one that they have been very vague on. Uh, indeed, the government of Ashraf Ghani uh, is called the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. So there's a bit of a battle of legitimacy there. And there is a lot of vagueness with regard to what exactly the Taliban would consider to be a problem. Islamic government. All right. And uh, the United States, um, as you say, it's unlikely that uh, we're going to see a, a, a troop withdrawal in the very near future. Why has it found itself in Afghanistan for this period of time? 
Well, I think what happened was that initially when the US invaded Afghanistan and started its occupation, it took uh, place under the premise of a uh, counter-terrorism mission. And to put a long story short, I think there was the absence of a long-term strategy and vision, uh, the corruption, uh, the lack of proper governance, the lack of proper state institutions, uh, all fed into the rise of the Taliban. And in trying to for, uh, create a arrangement or a resolution of the conflict with the Taliban, there have been numerous disagreements, not just within US administrations, but between the US administrations and the governments in Kabul. And the recent, for example, the Doha agreement was one such example where the Americans essentially undercut Kabul and negotiated with the Taliban directly because they simply lost confidence in the government uh, of Ashraf Ghani and lost confidence in the prospects of a military resolution of the conflict. What are they fearful of that can happen if America pulled out tomorrow? Well, I think there has been a lot of talk of uh, gr groups like Al-Qaeda and Daesh or the Islamic State. Uh, but those, uh, the Taliban have fought against the Islamic State for a number of years. And indeed, the Taliban have accused, in fact, the US and the government in Kabul of aiding Daesh to fight against the Taliban. What I think US policymakers are terrified of is a relapse back into a situation similar to that in the early 90s, where after the collapse of the Soviet-backed government, Afghanistan descended into civil war, and that civil war itself gave rise to the Taliban. And the U it would U look very bad on the US uh, after having invaded and occupied Afghanistan for two decades on the premise of uh, yeah, ideals like human rights, on democrat of democratic governance, of the rule of law, of women's rights, to leave Afghanistan unilaterally uh, and leave Afghanistan at a time where the Taliban have the upper hand on the military as well as the political table because the Taliban, for all intents and purposes, are the most unified political military organization in Afghanistan. And as such, there are real fears, not just in Kabul, but also uh, with, with policymakers in Washington, D.C., that the Taliban could once again take over Afghanistan and the U.S. would be left to deal with the blemish or the stain on its reputation. 1989, the Russians uh, exited stage right, and uh, they're starting to insert themselves back into the equation. Why? Well, I think fundamentally Russia uh, is very much concerned with its influence in the Central Asian Central Asia in general, and Afghanistan borders the Central Asian republics, which were at one point uh, constituent units of the Soviet Union. And uh, it was with with that in mind that the Russia that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Uh, it's always sought to. Uh, uh, influence events in Afghanistan. In, it was involved in the civil war of the 90s. It backed the Northern Alliance. It was on board with the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan. So Russia has always been involved. Uh, however, what's happened with the de relative decline of US power and the emergence of players like Russia and China on an international scale, what we're seeing is more of a Russian diplomatic effort uh, aimed at uh, what Moscow terms as uh, ending the Afghan conflict politically, which is something that the US in theory agrees with, but uh, it also poses its own problems because it uh, threatens to undercut US stewardship of the Afghan peace process. So the main players at the table, the Afghan government, um, the Taliban, and then of course the superpowers, are there other players that perhaps are not getting the attention that they deserve and if they are ignored can be a problem? Well, there are the, the other players, of course, include other, uh, Afghanistan's other neighbours. So the Central Asian republics, for example, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, have their own relations with the Taliban. Iran also has its own relations with the Taliban. But there's also the uh, aspect that... Uh, Iran has uh, vocally opposed the uh, US Taliban peace deal. Uh, India is another power in the region, which whilst it does not actually share a border with Afghanistan, uh, enjoys a lot of influence in Afghanistan by virtue of the government in Kabul. And so a lot of these powers would see, a lot of these states would see their influence uh, 
being threatened uh, with the collapse of the Afghan government or the resurgence of the Taliban. And with regard to India in particular, it would be most apprehensive about that because of what is seen as Pakistan's, or at least its intelligence and military apparatuses, close relations with the Taliban. Mm. So are you optimistic that anything can come out of this uh, a visit by Lavrov in uh, uh, Pakistan? Uh, I, I think I think there are other motivations and reasons mm. for the Russian foreign minister to be visiting Pakistan. In recent years, there have also been closer ties between Pakistan and Russia on a military as well as a political and diplomatic level. And so I, I, I don't see anything substantive coming out of uh, Lavrov uh, meeting Pakistani officials, at least strictly with regard to Afghanistan, given that the two, at least at face value, seem to be on board.